to everybody for coming uh, this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the morning. Um, welcome to our Fox and Friends set. Um, we'll call it <laughs> Margaret and Friends. Uh, Jen Psaki, uh, who's the, camp, uh, the traveling press secretary for the Obama campaign, and Kevin Madden uh, for the Romney campaign are joining us. Uh, they spend uh, a year on the road uh, with the promise of uh, you know, a hot food, clean underwear, and an office in the West Wing keeping them going. Um, and now they're going to join us and tell us what life is really like. And John Dickerson is going to get it out of them. Right, John? Uh, what goes on behind the curtain yeah. thank, thank when you, the Margaret. bus stops rolling? John Dickerson, CBS News. And don't forget Slate, too, Margaret. Oh. And, the, and the best online magazine other than the Atlantic, Slate. <laughs> thank you, Margaret. I can't tell whether we're in a living room or a therapy room with this. <laughs> so if oh, either one of you want to lie down... Uh, Airport yeah. Lounge, that's right. Well, we've got uh, 20 minutes until the shuttle departs for, I hope, Cancun or something. Um, so uh, let's start with both of you worked on worked for these candidates in the last campaign. You now are here for this one. Jen, what was, the, what was different this time around? Nothing. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you know, it was entirely different from the beginning. There's a lot that's been written about how it was different. Of course, you know, the first campaign, there was this amazing wave of excitement and enthusiasm. And, and many people were projecting what they wanted then candidate Senator Obama to be. This time was no question harder fought. Um, there were harder days. Um, there wasn't a wave at the end, as we all know. Um, a very, I'll call him a very, very senior administration official um, said yes, to me, which I think this is a very good analogy for it, that the first campaign was like being in a relationship where everything's gleeful and you're happy and you don't see any wrong in the other person and you know you just kind of ride the wave of happiness. And the second campaign was like after you've been married for a few years, you've got a couple <laughs> kids, uh, maybe you've had some squabbles, some you know financial disputes, but at the end of the day, you know you love the person that much more. Um, and that's how I think a lot of us felt. Uh, you know that we. It, it was harder fought, but it felt that much uh, sweeter at the end. Kevin, what about for you? Uh, well, I found that the speed was very different from the 2008 campaign. Um, I mean, I remember in the 2008 campaign, just on how Jen and I do our jobs, uh, in the 2008 campaign, I, logged, I, I had signed up for Facebook the first time just so I could see what Governor Romney's Facebook page looked like. I mean, that, that's how I found out about Facebook. And, you know, like two months later, I logged back on because it had gotten hacked into. And then I found out that uh, you I had 18 friends from grammar school who were looking for me. Right, right. right. <laughs> All of them um, at Farmville. Yeah, right, right, right. And um, I, we also didn't have Twitter. I mean, I remember calling up a guy. I, before I worked for Governor Romney, I worked for John Boehner in the majority leader's office, and then majority leader's office. And I called up our digital guy and I said, tell me about Twitter, how it's used, what, how it's going to work, is it going to the future? And he's like, ah, you don't need to know that. It's not, it's not a big thing. It's not going to take off. And here we are now, you know, I noticed during this campaign, so much of what we did was driven from, uh, from the bottom up through, through Twitter. Um, and, no, and, you know, even when that. I was on the plane, you know, we would go back, Jen and I would do our different gaggles. Jen would do it, of course, on a much bigger plane, Air Force One. I was doing it on what we called Air Force One. Um, we, um, I would go to the back of the plane and gaggle for 20, 15, 20 minutes. And by the time I would come back to the front of the plane, um, I would see on Twitter that I'd already made news. And so, people responded to you on Twitter and yeah, attacked you. Yeah, atta attacked <laughs> Both. Me. Yeah. Now, when you say people, you don't actually mean people. You mean reporters. Reporters. Well, right? Or people. Yeah, yeah. people. people. Or yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Not that I reporters. Don't... Reporters are not people. Yeah, no. That was that was on the free to me, free to be you and me CD. The reporters are people. Um, the uh, but but you mean this was the kind of um, backstage conversation you were watching play out on Twitter. Sometimes yeah. real people, mm -hmm. but it was more important for you what the journalists, how the journalists were using mm -hmm. Twitter and having yeah, this conversation. It became an incredible. Uh, it became an incredible news aggregator. You could see what journalists that you're covering from place from you know from outlets like TPM or others right. that are a little bit more left leaning. You see what they're saying. You see what folks on the right are saying. Then you see what folks that are supposed to be in the middle are saying. Uh, and also what operatives are saying on right and left, what the, what, the Demo, what, the, what the outside groups are saying. And you sort of got a good snapshot of where the, um, where the dialogue was going for the day. But what I found, just, uh, what I found was, was quite stunning was with the speed with which things mm -hmm. moved. I, you know, I worked on the 2004 campaign as well on President, um, um, President uh, Bush's reelect. 
And you know, you, you had until probably about 3.30 in the afternoon to sort of get your, your message together and then start calling through to your reporters in, mm -hmm. in states and start calling your wires before they started ripping copy. Now what happens is a tweet goes out, a, a, a blog posting goes up, and throughout the day it's updated. Uh, and I just found that that process, what happened was we didn't have a cycle. W it was every single day was just a nonstop news cycle. And multiple a day. Right. Now, does that put more, it would seem to me to put more of a premium on staying focused because you've got thousands of waves of questions from us and news cycles going by. So what was the one thing, if you had to keep your eye on the prize day after day, what was it for you? Uh, well, in terms of media, there's still a huge power in television and local television, national television, people watch that, that's still how people get their news. So that's part of it, I think. The Twitter piece, uh, you know, and I'm sure this was the same for the Romney team, there's a Twitter strategy around every debate, around every day, around every news push, around everything. Tweets you were supposed to send out, uh, around debates, it was things you wanted to trend, hashtags and things along, along those lines. So I think the challenge overall was, you know, I, I would almost relate it to a, a 13 or a 14 year old girl not being distracted by all the different mediums, the tweets and what was trending, what wasn't trending and, you know, the different blog posts and being focused on what your message was and what you were trying to get across that day and in the weeks ahead. Right. Yeah. And, and it was, we have so many instruments now at our disposal. I, I likened it to a symphony, which is that every single one of these instruments has to be playing the same note over and over all day long in order to break through. And whether it's what, you know, like Jen said, what, what are we, what's our Twitter strategy for debates? What's our Twitter, Twitter mm -hmm. strategies for a speech? And, and making sure that the, the digital side of things is integrating everything, including your volunteers and what they're saying out in the field, what your surrogates are saying on talk radio, mm -hmm. what they're saying on cable TV, and all of that. That, that was a, a very big challenge, I found. Now, just mm -hmm. to put a final period on this Twitter conversation, the point is not just the universe in which the Twitter conversation is happening. It's because it sets conventional wisdom that then filters up the news stream, yes? Right. Yes, and it, be, and it becomes a um, shiny ball, I think, that people chase, whether it is... Uh, somebody tweets about a crowd size or right. somebody tweets about something that um, Governor Romney said on his foreign trip or something President ba Obama said at an event and it becomes kind of a snowball that yeah. you have to deal with and you can't deal with other things. Yeah, it was like, T it was like TNT for the news cycle in many ways and um, oftentimes too it would um, it would uh, it would contribute to just a, it, would, it would of course make it larger right and then there was another thing too is reporters um, because of Twitter, I think they become much more competitive. Right. It's a competition between who can be the snarkiest, who can, who can put out, who can create the most content, who can then get something that's going to get more clicks and make more news. So that competition between um, um, media organizations as well then was something that you also had to manage uh, uh, on the communication and side. And there's a leveling. So you have yeah. people who are 23 who are also tweeting and people who are 55 who've been in the news business for... 30 years, and they're all tweeting, yeah. and there's a leveling of it that doesn't necessarily reflect the experience or perspective that typically news, news has. So let me ask you this question. It felt at times like the conversation was happening in that tiny little 140 character space. <laughs> and while it was happening over here, there was a big campaign going on over here that this conversation was not intersecting mm -hmm. with. Was there a moment or a, th or a, a turning point whether somewhere in the campaign where the conversation over here just got it totally wrong. Uh, there are probably many, but is there one that you can think of that? You know, this isn't the sexiest example, but the example that I think is very relevant and nobody talks about is for us, the convention speech was very purposely done in the way it was done. It was not the most exciting speech. It was not the president's race speech. It wasn't going into history books as the most amazing speech. However, it gave the American people a plan and an understanding of what he wanted to do moving forward and how he wanted to do it. And that's why we saw a bump in our polls post. Um, and it gave us a roadmap. And afterwards, uh, this is kind of the disconnect, you know, where we were all on this trip in Florida and we're reading all the analysis. And all the analysis is, this is terrible, it's horrendous, the campaign's over, you know, all these things. And we were thinking, well, we tested it. People really liked the speech. Um, they liked what he had to say, and that ended up being the roadmap for us moving forward. What about you, Kevin? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that this, I don't, I don't think that the war on women 
materialized uh, in the larger, among the larger electorate the way it did materialize in sort of this small sort of day-to-day hand-to-hand combat that we had on cable news and, and on blogs and in Twitter. Uh, I think we ended up having a really uh, difficult uh, marriage gap that I think affected our ability to win. But I think if you look at some of the exit polling and where we were with winning on the economy and winning with uh, and at least ma- having a, a manageable uh, gender gap where that wasn't as large, I think that was something that really did was catnip for a lot of the cable TV bookers, and it made for uh, you know the, the the sort of the outrage index that oftentimes comes with the dialogue that we have in campaigns. It fed that, but I don't think it materialized as a as a as a big as a difference that we saw in the campaign. In the end, Kevin, I was talking to somebody in the uh, Romney operation who said, uh, when we were talking about the polls and the yeah. evaluation of what happened in the end and why they were shocked, they thought it was a lot closer. Uh, they said, you know, we never ran the models of what it would be like right. if Democrats turned out the way they did. Can you talk a little bit about that, what the surprise was there at the end? Well, we, we looked at a lot of um, the models that had been, you know, 2000, 2000 model, the 2004, 2008, and, and we just figured, look, that with the enthusiasm level that we have and the enthusiasm gap that the Democrats have right now, we just don't believe it's going to be the same turnout um, and, the, and that there's going to, the composite of the electorate is going to look exactly like it did in 2008. And so we, there's been a lot of discussion in, since about how this electorate is changing. Well, I don't think that the Obama campaign gets enough credit for actually changing the electorate. I think their turnout model was extraordinary. They did very well, and they made sure that they they had the exact model of the electorate that they needed to win. You know, I talked to a lot of the folks that I worked with on the ground in states like uh, Ohio, and we would see these polls come out, public polls that would show uh, that we were four points down. They said, that's four points down, but that's based on a D plus seven model. It's not going to be D plus D seven. D plus seven it's, meaning, it's, explain it's, what yeah, that, that means. That it's going to be, uh, right, that it's going to be uh, a, a, a model that shows that, you know, that we're seven points more Democrats. And they said, at the very best, it's going to be D plus five, and we're probably likely to see D plus three. And it turned out it was exactly what the, the public polls had seen and exactly what I think the Obama folks were modeling their, their uh, uh, electorate on internally. So that's unfortunate, but we just, we just didn't believe that, that it was going to happen. And that's one of the hard things about making assumptions and, and guessing and, and, and turnout. But I think that they don't get enough credit for actually forcing, or not cre- but creating that composite of the electorate that they needed to win. Jen, was there ever a, a time, you know, in retrospect, you know, even people, are, uh, Kevin is gracious and giving credit to the campaign, but when you're going through it, uh, it's a nail biter, and this is a president who had a tough economy, and there was not the enthusiasm across the board. Um, was there ever a big, sort of dark, scary thing hanging out there that you were worried about that was sort of, I mean, one version would be what if the turnout numbers aren't what they were? What if, what was the big what if that, that kept you up at night? Of course. I mean, you worry that young people aren't going to turn out. We worried. Young people aren't going to turn out. You worry that there's this huge surge in growth in the Latino population. The president ended up winning more Latino votes because in part of the growth of the population than anyone in American history. But, you know, that requires getting people out, getting them registered, getting them out. I mean, that was one of the reasons why early voting was such a big part of our strategy. You saw an increase in early voting in some key states, Iowa, Nevada, Ohio, by a couple percentage points, but that makes a big difference. And the way we focused on that was targeting the people who were less likely voters. Uh, But there are always moments, you know, and there are moments during the campaign um, where you think, uh oh. <laughs> so. How about after that first debate? Oh, why did I was? I'm so surprised. That's what you brought up. Um, you know, that well, was... his water reclamation uh, <laughs> plans was my second. Right. Um, you know, the first debate. As someone who ha- has worked for him on and off for about six years, and I was there for the whole time from beginning to end in 2007, 2008. The first debate was very important for us, and in fact, probably a defining point for us. Um, and it reminded a lot of us of when we lost the New Hampshire primary in 2008, when you kind of think, we're in a good place, we're sailing toward a good place, and then you think, uh-oh, hold on, there's a rock. Um, and the first debate, you know, going into it, you don't know how you're going to do. No one knows. You can get a vibe from your candidate. You can talk to everybody who's been a part of it. But he hadn't done one in four years. We didn't know how it was going to go. Afterwards, we didn't actually think it was as bad as everybody else did. And we all went out on TV and talked to everybody. And it was only until a day or so later 
Um, but that was defining. But you'd, but you'd seen Twitter, which was melting. Yes, Twitter was <laughs> melting down. My computer was on fire. Um, you know, it was important for us because it was a hunkering down for us. It was a reminder that, uh, which we knew all along, that this was going to be very hard fought. Um, the president took a lot of um, it on himself and was kind of bucking everybody up around him. Um, but it was, it was really important for us because we needed to have that moment. He's great when his back is against the wall. He was, you know, and, 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 and it was important for, for all of those reasons. Kevin, tell us, take us a little bit inside of Mitt Romney. Preparing for that first debate, he'd had a, uh, not a great September. Uh, so his back was against the wall going into that first debate. Do what Jen did, which is give us a little sense of Mitt Romney, somebody who people had a little bit difficult time getting a hold of. Yeah as he prepares for that first debate and then comes out of it? Well, that was one of the things that ever since I started working for Governor Romney uh, six years ago, um, that I always said, you know, if I could just get this guy into everybody's living room for 90 minutes and let them see the command of the issues that he has and his ability and his vision for the country, that he'd be able to win. And that was something that we looked at as we prepared for the debates, was this is his chance to sit down for 90 minutes and sort of cut through a lot of the 30-second advertising that had been bombarding people with negative information about Governor Romney. I actually was, was very surprised at, at not, 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 not very surprised, but I was very happy with the performance, obviously, in Denver. But I think largely because, as an Irishman, I'm just a total fatalist. Like, I always <laughs> expect the worst to happen. So I was so, you know, and, which means that you're always kind of pleasantly surprised in the end. Um, but but the, the prep sessions, I didn't believe, went very well. Like, I thought Portman was so extraordinary. He was so good at really just getting at Governor Romney and um, really putting him on the defensive and just, you know, and, and so I thought that the performance wise I started to worry. But once I think um, the governor got out there and he did get comfortable and, and he did see this, uh, this opportunity to cut through and actually talk directly to the voters, that was something that was a talking point, but it was also very true. Um, so I think once he had that up there and he, he, and he knew he had that opportunity to talk right to voters, he took it and he did, you know, and, and, and we saw the results. What do you think he'll do now? Uh, I don't know. I know, I know he, um, he'll, he'll spend some time with his family. One of the, one of the things I was struck by was um, when we were on the plane one of the last few days, uh, I, I had asked him, I said, you know, a lot of the, these reporters now, as we get closer and closer, they're going to try and force questions up on you, like, you know, what, what happens if you win? What happens if you lose? And we, I don't think we'd ever really talked about, you know, you don't go through these, the brutality of these things without, and actually thinking that you're going to lose. But being the, being the press guy, my job is to put him on the couch and prepare him for these questions. And I said, you know, they're going to ask you, what do you do if you lose? And he said, you know, if I win, I'm going to be very excited because then I get to do all the things that I've been talking about over the last six years. And um, I get to, um, you know, put my plan into action. But if I lose, he goes, I'll also be very excited because I get to go on with my life. I have a great life. I have a wonderful wife, a family, and there's other things that I can still do. So I think the other things that he can still do, I think he, he, he's probably going to, he has to figure that out. Um, I think, you know, he wrote a lot in his journal, so I expect that we'll probably, you know, maybe we'll see a book out of it. It'll be one about the ideas and the experiences. It'll be much more substantive than just a, you know, a campaign manifesto. Um, God knows we haven't, we'll have enough of those. Um, <laughs> that'll be part of the second part of my therapy. You all here are the first part of my therapy. <laughs> um, but I think that he'll, he'll still, he's not going to drop off the map. I think he's going to want to play a role. Uh, I think that the party right now has to get back to fixing the infrastructure as part of our get out the vote. We also have to remember that this is still, uh, we have to be a party of ideas and we have to constantly harness, uh, or find new ideas and harness some of the energy around those ideas and then help some of the individuals that are going to be a part of the party going forward. Uh, and so I think he'll try and help them too. Jen, I want to close with you, which is you were with the president in Iowa, a very emotional place for him. Uh, he's not going to, he doesn't have any more campaigns ahead of him. Give us a little short picture there of what it was like being with him as it was coming to an end? Well, you know, he's not a very publicly emotional guy, as most people know, but he, he said later that he was struck by, you know, he knew it was his last event, everybody's tired, you know, we're, you're all the walking dead. It's both campaigns, every reporter, you're kind of trying to make it through election day. <laughs> but, um, you know, he looked out that night and saw all these faces of these people who believed in him and were with him in 2007. And I don't mean, ran I don't mean random faces, I mean three or four people he actually recognized and knew and kind of waved at him and waved back. And that struck him and I think really impacted him. And you could see he got a little emotional that night. And he was very reflective, as, as it sounds like Governor Romney was as well. And I remember the morning of the election, we were you know, waiting to do the umpteen interviews you do the day of election. And he said, 
you know, I've thought about how Governor Romney and his supporters have fought just as hard as we have, and his supporters believe in him just as much as ours do. And there's kind of this untold bond, I guess is how I would say, when you've been through this crazy journey that you have some reflection for the other person. Um, but yeah, he was, he was pretty introspective and, and taking it all in. I think he did about three or four laps of the, um, of the room kind of shaking hands because he knew it was the last time. Yeah. All right, Jen Saki, thanks so much. Thank Kevin you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Thanks,